Hello everyone, this is Manyepa and um, I'm here to do this paper which is Chemistry 2, a theory and uh, it's from the year 2021, November 17. That's my name right there, that's my name. I'll do question 1 to 4 of section A, then uh, I'll do question 5 to 8 uh, in another part. So we get to question 1 of section A. Um, the following is a heating curve for substance W. You can call it W for substance W. So this is our y-axis uh, representing temperature in degrees Celsius and that's our time in minutes. Okay, and so first question which is A. In what state or states is substance W at point A, B, C? Let's look at this graph. Uh, we are told that this graph is simply a heating curve. It's not a cooling curve. If it's a cooling curve, then we would have looked at it in a different way. But since we're talking of it being a heating curve, then it means that um, it's, it's, it's possible for us to, to determine what changes are taking place along the what? The curve. So my conclusion was that at A, this substance was a solid. At B, the substance began melting. Okay, and its temperature became, con became constant because during phase change, either melting or evaporating, the temperature of a, that given substance becomes constant provided it's pure. Okay, if it's not pure, then the temperature will not really be constant, but it will be somehow a range. So it will have some kind of a slope, but this one is constant. So solid melting, meaning solid and liquid, liquid, then heat gas and liquid, then heat is gas, okay? So my conclusion there is that as part A, the sub, sub, substance W was solid. At point B, substance W was solid and liquid, meaning it was melting, changing phase from solid to liquid. Then at C, substance W was a liquid. Okay, that's chemistry 10 for you criteria of purity. Number B, state whether substance W is pure or not. Explain your answer. My explanation of my state is that W is pure because it has a sharp melting and freezing point. Even if here my freezing point is not labeled, oh no, uh, I, I've just said freezing, I'm supposed to say evaporation. And since this one is not labeled, allow me to just cancel off Maybe this part here, since it's not even needed much, it wasn't even labeled. I'll just say melting because melting has been labeled here. It's part of the whole thing. It has a sharp melting point. For the love of science, we do these things. Question two: uh, To obtain a pure dry, to obtain pure dry crystals of the hydrate of the hydrate magnesium sulfate heptahydrate from an aqua solution magnesium sulfate the process of crystallization is used following the four steps the process of crystallization is used following the four steps um, these are the steps and then the first question reads arrange these steps in order of occurrence my take was that you heat to saturation point so step one was this i was writing one two three four um, step two was cool down slowly. Okay, you cool down slowly, meaning you leave it to cool down naturally. Don't force it to cool. Number three, filter. Then number four, dry in a desiccator. A desiccator is a big glass-like vessel where you put your substances so, uh, for them to, to dry. Uh, yeah, for them to dry. Uh, number B, for each step in A, give a reason for for taking such an action. So step one, reason for step one, which is this one here. You are heating that given solution, okay, of magnesium uh, sulfate so that you can have a saturated solution. And the reason why you're heating to saturation point is to get rid of excess solvent and concentrate the solution. Crystals do not form from a dilute solution because they are the, the, the components of, of those crystals or the ions that are supposed to make that crystal are far apart. Understand that crystals are usually or made of uh, metallic ions and um, 
non-metallic ions. Although crystals can also be made from covalent compounds like sugar crystals, but I'm just uh, inclining myself from the already given example here, which is that of uh, magnesium sulfate. So uh, when these species are far apart, they will not interact to form crystals, to form that structure of, of, of that uh, crystal. They, they will not interact because um, ionic compounds, like in this case here, result from the interaction between uh, cations and anions. So you concentrate to reduce the space uh, between them, remove some excess solvent so that the species can interact and eventually bond as they cool down slowly. Number B, uh, cool down slowly, what was the reason for step two? To allow crystallization to take place. Therefore, as they cool down, they're having space to repel each other and attract each other according to their charges and eventually bond ionically because this is magnesium sulfate, it's an ionic compound. Uh, so to allow crystallization to take place so allow crystals to form three remove excess solvent okay you filter step three is filtration to remove excess solvent therefore separate crystals from the solvent as you allow it to cool down slowly crystals are going to form but you will find that there might be or there will be some kind of solvent that will remain there so you will remove the solvent from the from the from the separate the solvent from the crystals then you place in a desiccator uh, you are actually just drying the crystals. Okay, you are drying the crystals. You are removing uh, any remaining solvent that would have remained uh, around the crystal. So you are drying the crystals in the desiccator. See, explain why magnesium sulfate uh, heptahydrate crystals may be dry and yet contain water molecules. Look at this. This is magnesium sulfate. It ha and each uh, formula unit of magnesium sulfate for every one formula unit of magnesium sulfate there are seven water molecules heptahydrate if these were five I would have said pentahydrate uh, if they were eight I would have said octahydrate you know or you can just say hydrated magnesium sulfate but that's the ratio here for every one you have seven of these how come the crystals may be dry and yet they contain the molecules of water? This is because the water is part of the crystal lattices or crystal structure and not, in, or not by itself, okay, not in its liquid form. So the water is part of the crystal structure and it's important because without the water, that crystal structure cannot be sustained. Heating this salt will cause the water to finally evaporate if you just heat the dry salt and it will become amorphous or powder, it will lose its crystal nature. So my answer was water is part of the crystal lattice. Lattice just means crystal structure and not in liquid form. Next question, the following diagram shows the structure of an element X. Uh, what type of bonds would be formed when X reacts with hydrogen? Look at that X. The number of electrons in the outermost shell, the valence shell electrons, tell you the group of the uh, the group where the element belongs to in the periodic table, and the group or the number again you can you can derive the valence of that element from the outermost shell electrons. This element is from group what? One, two, three, four, five, six from group six, and then the number of shells tell you the period where the element belongs to. There are how many shells here? One, two. This element is from period two, one, two, and group six because there are six electrons in the outermost shell. And we're talking about hydrogen. This element can even be oxygen. Okay, it can be any group, any element in period six. Its valency is two because eight minus six gives you two. So it's, it's it, the, the kind of bonding that would result would be covalent. Co meanings both. Okay, sharing of both valences. So covalent bonds. Give a reason for your answer because they are both non-metal. This species is a non-metal and hydrogen is a non-metal. Why am I saying it's a non-metal? It has got more than three electrons in the outermost shell. If it had three or less, I would have given it, um, I would have said it's more metallic. So because they are both non-metals, non-metals share electrons. There's nothing like tr electron transfer. Number C, draw the dot and cross structure of the compound formed when um, X bonds with hydrogen atoms. I'm um, sorry, I just drew the atomic diagram here. The dot and cross structure. Um, hmm. 
Okay, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I've just lost a little bit of my 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 track here. Allow me to just maybe dot and cross structure. Is this okay? I, I feel it's this one because I was almost thinking of the lowest dot and cross formula. Okay, where I would have said um, I draw my um, I don't know what symbols I could have used, but the problem is I have not been given what this element is. So I went for this. I could have gone for something like uh, let me just take it that this is oxygen, but I've not been told that it's oxygen. So that's where I got stuck to draw the lowest dot and cross formulas. But if I was told that this element is oxygen, or I was told this is um formed when x reacts okay i would have just okay since they've given me x i would have done this where i just show the outermost shell electrons um then hydrogen will have something like this okay and then the other spectator or non-bonding electrons would have been like that okay so i was a little bit skeptical this is my lowest dot and cross formula this is um, an atomic structure and they're saying draw the dot and cross structure this is a structure this is a formula so if they had said dot and cross formula or lewis uh, formula i think i would have gone for this where i put the electrons being shared i align them in this manner and then those that are not being shared i align them in this manner okay so i i drew this one hopefully i'm, I'm okay with this okay so i was a little bit skeptical on this but I too, I went for this. Um, give two characteristics of the compound formed in C. It's a covalent compound. Therefore, it does not conduct electricity and has a low melting point. Covalent compounds generally have got low melting points. Question four. Elena wanted calcium oxide for drying ammonia gas, but only had 2.4 grams of calcium carbonate in the laboratory. She heated the chemical strongly and it decomposed con completely to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. She weighed the calcium oxide and was found to be 1.35 grams. Write the chemical equation for this reaction. So that's my chemical equation. You have to know the chemical symbols. They've just given you words. Calcium carbonate. So the chemical equation is going to be calcium carbonate solid. Remember the state symbols. Here I was almost writing plus, so don't mind about this. So calcium carbonate gives us after heating, you can even put heating here, you can put uh, delta H, which is okay. So that there's heating which took place, carbon dioxide, calcium oxide. It's balanced just the way it is. Solid, gas, solid. Okay, white, of course carbon dioxide is colorless and this guy is black. Oh no, no, no it's also white, it's also white. Copper is the one which is black, copper oxide. Calculate the theoretical yield of calcium oxide. So I'm getting my ratios from the balanced equation. Where this one, the, uh, this one is 40, this is 12, and this is 16 times 3. The um, molecular mass, or maybe not, this is, a, um, this is not a molecule, it's a formula unit. Let me say the molar mass of this is 100. Okay, it is heated to decompose and form 56 grams of calcium oxide. This is 40, this is 16 on the periodic table. So the ratios are 100 is to 56. Therefore, if this learner had 2.8, then it should be able to give us X, theoretically. So the ratio is this. When I cross multiply, I create an equation where X is equal to 2.8 times 56 over 100. When you cross multiply, it's going to be 100x, and it's going to be 2.5 times 50x, 56, and then I divide by 100, then my answer comes out as 1.57 grams. That is the theoretical yield. In theory, this is what you're supposed to get, okay, once you decompose uh, 2.8 grams of calcium carbonate. The next question there says, uh, calculate the percentage yield of the calcium oxide. How much yield? Uh, in the question, we're told that the learner got this much after the uh, after the decomposure of the calcium carbonate. Uh, this learner got 1.35 grams. So I write my formula: theoretical percentage yield is equals to actual yield over T. This T is actually theoretical yield times 100. So the actual yield, what the learner got, was this here 1.35, which is this one 1.35. Then in theory. If all of it decomposes, then the learner is supposed to get 1.57. So I divide this actual over theoretical times 100, it gives me 86%.
why is actual yield less than theoretical yield there are many factors like um uh, the reaction not really getting to completion uh, side reactions and conditions not really being uh, uh, favorable uh, like 100 percent favorable for the reaction to go to completion so sometimes you may be asked to give one or two possible reasons why you can never get 100% of yield. Even when you plant 100 seeds of maize, you cannot get all of them um, uh, to germinate sometimes. There's high probability that you may not get all of them to germinate. So the yield is 86%. Calculate the volume of the carbon dioxide collected at room temperature and pressure in this experiment. Therefore, in the experiment that the learner carried out where she got 1.35 grams, like here where she got, you know, she found to be, or and was found to be 1.3. So after getting this, how much carbon dioxide was produced after this much calcium oxide was produced because they are moving together. So their ratios are also fixed. For you to get this much calcium oxide, then there should be a fixed volume of carbon dioxide you should get. Okay, under RRTP, RRTP, room temperature and pressure, one at most here, 25 degrees of temperature. So I get my equation again, calcium carbonate, you heat, you've got CO2 and CaO. So under these perfect conditions, when this one, one more of this decomposes, you're going to get 24 decimeter cubic of carbon dioxide and 56 grams. This is 40 on the periodic table. The, the molar mass is 40, so 16, you add the two, gives you 56. So if 24 decimeters, this is equal to one, two liters, 24 liters or 24 decimeters are, uh, uh, is produced together with, with 56 or results when 56 grams of calcium uh, oxide results from the decomposition of this then you should have x okay decimeter cubic of of gas when you have this and this is the mass that the learner got so the ratios are fixed it's like when you peel five bananas how many peels are you going to have or how many bananas are you going to have? You're going to have five. So for every five bananas, there should be five peels somewhere, but not on the floor because you know what happens when you step on a banana peel. You cry for your mama. So X is equals to, after I do my cross multiplication, X times 56, and then 1.35 times that gives me 24 times this, then over 56, the answer is 0 0.57 decimeter cubic. That's the volume that is obtained. So I end here for this video, I'll do another part because if I do all the eight, I'll clock even an hour. So let's close this for now and I'll see you in the next video.